And it's my privilege to be here, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I was delighted when uh, ISPICAN decided to make this the topic of their second Denver thinking space. Um, because in my country, uh, the country in which I live and work, the prevention of child sexual abuse uh, has been very much neglected. Uh, we have very high levels of sexual abuse of children and sexual violence against women. Um, and many of the responses have been very knee-jerk and not systematically planned and certainly not systematically reviewed after implementation. So, yes, you're right, Jenny, this is very close to my heart. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the Denver uh, Thinking Space, this is uh, something that we're planning on doing every two years, to bring international experts together in order to debate a specific child protection challenge, share theory, research, and evidence-based practice on the topic, and then develop a report that provides the international community with a snapshot of high-level clinical and policy advice that is informed by multicultural, multilingual, and multidisciplinary input. And this is important because we are a membership organization that has members from many countries around the world, um, representing many cultures, many languages, but also universally applicable and adaptable across language and culture. Um, that's quite a high aim. Sensitive to the realities of resources. And I must be honest with you, when I listen to some of the presentations today, I'm kind of quite envious of many of the resources that do exist uh, in this country. But also a practical resource for the use of senior practitioners hoping to influence policymakers, donors, and senior officials in their own geographical and cultural areas. So it has quite high aims, this particular um, project of ESPCANS. The first report was on the sexual abuse of children, and you can um, access it through our website, and if you uh, fill out your evaluation, you will get the presentation with the website address on it. Um, but what we looked at in 2013 was, well, how do you prevent sexual abuse? And the focus was particularly on men and boys. In many countries around the world, we've done a lot of talking about empowering the girl child. And so sometimes we find that the focus on men and boys is forgotten and lost. Um, it wasn't a one-size-fits-all exercise, but really an exercise to establish some generic principles and concepts for prevention in the field of child sexual abuse. The process of the research was iterative. We kept, uh, apart from the uh, initial research, which was questionnaire-based, we have workshopped it at all the ISPCAN conferences regional, um, regionally held over the last year and at the San Diego Child Maltreatment Conference so that all the time we've been talking to people working in the field and saying, right, what have you got that you can share that we can add um, to this particular research project? We invited experts in the field to make further contributions, and we will be presenting the very final consolidated paper in our uh, ISPCAN conference in Japan 2014, and Jenny has brought pamphlets on that that are on the tables outside. So we started off with a questionnaire that was sent to researchers and practitioners around the world, and snowballing sampling was used as Practitioners and researchers heard about the project. Some of them contacted us and said we'd like to offer information. Um, and we also built on the context we already had. So the first round of questionnaires went to 148 professionals in 94 countries. And this included countries in every region of the world. Um, and we also used UNICEF's network as well and the networks of other organizations like EPIC. ECPAT um, International. 40 professionals responded to the survey, 24% of those contacted plus minus, and responses were received from 28 countries, just over 10% of the world's countries. At least one response was received from each major region. 
And our key survey findings are as follows. There are promising examples of preventative work with men and boys in all five major regions of the world. And there are many countries and parts of the world where preventative work uh, with men and boys is absent or else in the early stages of development. And there are many positive examples of collaboration where work has begun in one country and then has been adapted and extended to other countries. And I just want to focus on adaptation because... It's very seldom you can take a program that has an evidence base in one country and just apply it. You really have to fit it to the culture, the resources, etc., in the, uh, the next country you move to. Um, and there are international networks of organizations and donors addressing the issue of prevention, which facilitates the exchange of information and the efforts to adapt concepts and principles to new contexts and cultures. And this is really one example, this particular conference in which we have colleagues, other colleagues from Africa who are here, and it's great to see you here sharing in the exchange of information. Um, but this is an area in which there are needs for critical support. First of all, the work has to be embedded in a well-implemented legal and policy framework. And I don't know if Steve is still here, but... Um, one of the things we thought we could add to his typology, uh, perhaps looking at primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, was the concept of your, uh, your, policy, your law and policy environment. Um, one needs clear, well-understood mandate from governments, backed by resources and infrastructure. This is not work that can be done with just civil society organisations on its own. One needs reliable long-term financial support. We're not talking about programmes that have a very short life uh, period. We're looking at programmes that need to be ongoing over periods of time. Cooperative arrangements between individuals, governments, donors, organisations, countries. Challenges, though. Prevention is low priority. Somehow we've become very uh, victim and prosecution orientated in many countries around the world. And this is con concerning. Sometimes I really believe we're looking at the wrong end and, of the equation, the abuse equation, and plowing resources into the wrong end of the abuse <coughs> equation. The actual concept of prevention is not always well understood. The lack of resources is something that's experienced across the world. Training, funding, facilities. Funding is often limited in short term, although some donors do appear to recognise the need for more sustained supportive programmes. And I feel incredibly sad when we perhaps come across a programme that shows enormous promise as a pilot but funding is finished after a short period of time. Um, one has to also look at cultural and social attitudes, disbelief, denial, discrimination. The constructs of masculinity in many cultures are cause for concern as well. Many of them support aggressive sexual behaviour and male entitlement. Um, it's also a very taboo and difficult nature uh, subject um, in many countries. The absence of and resistance to sex education in this country, we heard an um, input on that this morning. I think we certainly find this in many countries in which religion and culture is very conserv conservative around sexual issues. There's very limited research on the effectiveness of primary prevention programs. And one of my challenges um, and I'm not sure if the question comes up in the uh, balance of the slides, is what constitutes good enough evidence? Um, what is a good enough evidence base in order to take a program forward and replicate it past its pilot stage? The use of internet and social media has also changed um, the nature of child abuse with children's access to an experience of pornography and violence. And of course, access by those who commit offences against children to these ways of bringing children into sexual relationships. Working across disciplines and services as well. This is an interdisciplinary effort. Geography and the accessibility of services. 
Um, this is a particular challenge in my country. There are so many children we can't reach with services just simply because of their geographical location. And so we've tried uh, this year uh, an experimental service in terms of bringing children and their caregivers to services. Um, but that is expensive. The absence of a government strategy supported by resources and clear accountability and the fact that the issue of prevention is neglected in some vulnerable groups, for example, children with disability. And I had a meeting yesterday uh, with one of the disability sectors internationally, and we talked a lot about this, that in this particular field, children with disability are often the last to receive input services, education, and so on. Um, just to say that we identified evidence-based programs at every level, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Um, I'm not going to list them all. Um, key findings on programs, tertiary programs of work with men and boys who offend are, seem to be the most well-developed and extensive. Work with boys and young men with sexually harmful behaviour are the most widely described secondary intervention, but primary prevention interventions exclusively for men and boys are the least well developed. The majority focus on self-protection from abuse and are for mixed gender groups. We believe that the public health approach shows the most promise, but there needs to be a gendered approach um, we need a four-level ecological approach addressing societal, community, relationship and individual factors that increase risk or provide protect, protective, um, an, a protective element. We also need a developmental approach. The needs of children across childhood differ from one stage to another. We also need to adapt strategies to political, social, cultural and religious contexts and be guided by behaviour change theory. We also need to recognise, and this is, I think, being talked about a lot this morning, child sexual abuse has no single cause and there's no single solution. It needs to be multi-layered in terms of strategy. Um, and both long and term, uh, short term strategies are, are relevant. We need to adapt concepts and programs to contexts and cultures rather than efforts at blanket application. Uh, the small, small bone and other typology and framework, uh, as far as our research was concerned, showed a lot of promise. And I'm not going to discuss that because it's been discussed already this morning. So, key messages for practice. Preventing a significant proportion of child sexual abuse is possible. That's very positive. Prevention can happen at any stage of the life cycle, but the earlier the better. Limited resources are not necessarily a bar to primary prevention work. And this was very interesting. In some of the poorest countries of the world, we had responses that it, it indicated uh, the existence of evidence-based prevention programs. Prevention is not just a professional problem. The scale of the problem requires everybody to play a part. So we need to extend our activities well beyond the child protection field. Men and adolescent boys should be seen not just as the problem, but as part of the solution. They're our partners. Tackle the marginalisation of fathers. This was an issue in many countries, and men and boys generally. We need to engage, encourage, and support men to care for their children. Children, parents, and carers need information about healthy and harmful and illegal sexual behaviour, and to be able to talk about safety, consent, abuse, and its consequences. Again, a recurring theme today. We need to learn to be comfortable discussing sex in developmentally appropriate and culturally sensitive ways. We need to be ready to recognise and act on red flags and early indicators of dysfunctional behaviour, but beware of premature labelling or criminalisation of children. Intervention should be based on holistic, multidisciplinary, developmentally informed assessments using validated measures, and assessments should address how to manage risks posed whilst treatment is underway. Developmental approach is essential in work with young people who sexually <coughs> harm others. 
and programs that work for adults may lack this dimension. Research supports the use of short-term sexually abusive behaviour focused CBT interventions such as multi-systemic therapy which includes input to carers as well. And the involvement of caregivers has just come up in the previous presentation and appears to be absolutely vital, essential. Empathy and the quality of relationships are critical to the effectiveness of therapeutic interventions. And I would say this is really very important when you're working with young people whose behaviour has already raised red flags. We also need to recognise the impact of work with men and boys who sexually offend on one's own health and well-being and take measures to sustain oneself. I think that's something that perhaps we haven't talked about enough today. I know we often hear that this is difficult work and that therefore self-care is important. And I think it is important to remind ourselves of this this, uh, this afternoon. The protection of children who are particularly vulnerable, the disabled, those involved in commercial sexual exploitation may require specific prevention strategies and programs. Sensitivity to culture and context, we've, I've mentioned several times, but the following suggestions might be helpful. We need to be guided by behaviour change theory, be clear about purpose and what needs to change and the resulting benefits. We need to carry out high quality research on prevalence and nature of risks to influence decision makers and challenge denial of the problem. And that might differ enormously from one context to another, the nature of those risks. We need to embed the prevention of child sexual abuse in other uh, programs, including mainstream programs and more linkages with other work to prevent different forms of gender-based violence and involve people who understand the cultural norms and know how to communicate sensitively on this subject when we're working across cultures. Also consider working with people with social and media communication expertise within that culture and context. Consult parents and children to understand better what changes are needed and what approaches are likely to work best. Involve them as advocates. Use language, tools, and methods that are culturally acceptable to integrate prevention messages. Work in partnership with local NGOs if we are transferring programs into another context. And work with community leaders and identify champions of change whose views will be protected. So if you would like to read the full report, and I would recommend you do, although it is very long. Um, <laughs> Do visit our website. Um, it will be up on our website very soon. The preliminary report um, is already up on the website, and you will be pleased to know we do have an executive summary, um, which will help you capture the essence of uh, what I've discussed today. And also, we'd like to invite you to the ISPICAN International Conference in Nagoya, Japan. Uh, from the 14th to the 17th of September in 2014. Um, so you are most welcome to join us there and to hear more about this particular research. It is too late to submit an abstract on your own research, but there's always 2016, 2018. Thank you. And while we're doing a plug on conferences, more close to home next September in uh, Bucharest, we're having a, a European regional conference. So that will be something that I'm sure a lot of you will wish to think about putting in an abstract for and contributing to. Now, Joan, do you want to take some any questions? Joan's given us a huge amount of information in a very quick time. And I do recommend you look at the report. I've just had to read it to kind of sign it off before we publish. And reading it again in the cold, hard light of day reminded me of just how much information is in the report that is extremely interesting and useful. So I would encourage you to dip into it and, and to really think about some of the issues. And I know we're going to hear in a moment about one of the programs, the Hedgehogs program, that is in fact one of our kind of 
interesting programmes that has been used in different cultures and contexts as well as the UK. But are there any questions for Joan that we could just take briefly? We've got a little bit of time. Any questions anyone wants to ask? So, yeah, such an important piece of work. Um, and, and obviously, um, as, as the departments and years go by, um, you know, new, new programmes develop. Uh, so, uh, I just wonder what, what the plans were in Ispagan for, for it to be refreshed and renewed and, and whether there was some, uh, some dynamic to the, to the work because it's, it's, it's really valuable. John, I agree with you and it's the same with the first gender thinking space as well. You know, we move on, we develop new methods, new ways of doing things, new knowledge. And I think there is a need to revisit these documents and update them from time to time. The big challenge is, of course, funding. Um, but most certainly, I mean, it's something that we could look at as an organization and see whether or not we can gather the resources to update it. And I just want to issue an invitation as well. Um, if you're interested in making a contribution, um, before we close off this phase of research, you can contact either Jenny and I. We'll send you the questionnaire that we used. We'll try and integrate, even at this stage, of the final report development, you know, um, anything that you feel is or believe is evidence-based in the area of prevention. 